So if you came to this video looking for answers, here you go. I'm not making any money off these videos, so I have no reason to waste your time. Over the next 14 to 15 minutes, I'm going to explain how I came upon these numbers, but this is the accuracy that I found for each given technique that I decide to compare my performance to. The low speed row refers to speeds at or below 180 knots. The high speed row refers to speeds above 180 knots. And accuracy is the overall total accuracy across all speeds sampled. So I flew from 120 to 240 knots and this is the cumulative accuracy. The most consistent technique I found was the nautical miles per minute squared divided by nine technique. The most accurate at low speed is gonna be the 1% rule. The most accurate high speed technique is Mach minus two. And going forward, I'm gonna use the 1% rule for my turn radius calculations. Now let's get on to the full video. All right, so this whole video started, I took a student up on the nav dollar ride that you see here. Uh, we're shooting approaches into Woodring on a 3-5 day. This next approach is gonna be the ARC 3-5 via pods on the ILS. I told him how to calculate a lead radial and this right here happened. This is the cause of this video. My calculations were way off. We overshot. Winds were not overshooting, so I have no idea what happened. But uh, from this point forward, I decided I was going to be a master of all things turn radii and lead radials. So, hope you enjoy the video. So over the next couple days, I started uh, doing some research and gathering different people's techniques on how to calculate turn performance. So after I got all these techniques together, I came up with a method of validating those techniques against real world turn performance in the aircraft. So the way in which I went about doing this is that before I even took off, I recorded the temperature, the altimeter setting, and the expected winds aloft, which was 045 at 10 degrees. Then my plan was to fly at 10,000 feet MSL because that would make the math easy in case I needed the altitude for some of those calculations. And on the fence end, I recorded the actual winds aloft and the actual temperature at altitude. So I got an actual temperature of six degrees Celsius and the winds were 045 at seven degrees instead of 10. So what this allowed me to do was uh, calculate my true airspeed because as we all remember, our ground speed is equal to true airspeed minus the headwind. So if I have a target true airspeed of 150 knots in a particular turn, I'm going to subtract seven from that to come up with the ground speed of 143 knots on my GPS. As I go through the turn and I'm 90 degrees off, I expect my ground speed to trend towards my true airspeed to be 150. And once I'm facing away from the wind with the tailwind, my ground speed should trend towards 157. So how did I collect the turn radius data? Well, first I OBS a course of 045 off of a waypoint within my MOA. Then for each given airspeed of two, 2.5, three, 3.5, and four nautical miles per minute, I flew four 180 degree turns. At the end of each turn, I looked at my GPS to determine my cross track distance and recorded that number. After four attempts, if I had any number that was more than 10% off from the other three, I reattempted until I got four data points that were all within 10% of each other. Okay, so where am I getting all these numbers from? So procedure is that the 11202 Vol 3 states that we need to make all turns during entry and while holding at three degrees a second, 30 degrees a bank, or 25 degrees a bank when using a flight director system. My personal technique is to also apply that to any published approach procedure. So that'll be procedure turns, arcs, holding in lieu of procedure turns, any type of charted procedure, I'm just gonna use the math for a standard holding turn so I keep my math consistent. So for the T6, we can pretty much rest assured that a standard rate turn is gonna be three degrees per second. However, moving up to 240 knots true, the bank angle required to maintain three degrees per second nose rate through the turn is gonna be 31 degrees angle of bank. So after collecting the data, I was able to come up with the Excel spreadsheet that you see on your screen now. Across all charts, the x-axis refers to the true airspeed, and the y-axis refers to the turn radius in nautical miles. 
For the tables, the airspeed column references the true airspeed. The standard rate only column refers to the radius when I flew a standard rate turn for the given airspeed. And the holding turns column refers to flying 30 degrees angle of bank or three degrees per second, whichever required lesser bank. In my experiment, the only difference between the two was in the 240 knots column. All right, so up next is the performance validation section. All I wanted to do here was to prove that the numbers that I recorded were accurate or at least within the ballpark of what we should have expected based on the actual math. So the actual calculations used to determine the expected turn radius based on 30 degrees of bank or a standard rate turn and your given airspeed are relatively complex and they could be their own entire video explaining the theory behind them. However, it's comforting to know that after throwing the variables into the calculator, it spit out numbers that were actually pretty close to what I found in the real world. So between the roughly 30 data points represented on this chart, I found that my recorded performance was between 6 and 9% of the theoretical turn radius for the given range of airspeeds that I sampled. One thing to note is that going forward, I'll be using the holding turns column to compare the accuracy between my performance and a given technique because when actually using this math, we'll most likely be using this in a holding situation or using similar airspeeds and techniques on an instrument approach in order to accomplish this. So the first technique that we're gonna compare is the 1% rule. I got this technique from a Navy friend of mine who likes to use it because there's plenty of other cool things you can do using the 1% math. In this technique, you take 1% of your true airspeed and divide it by two. So if your true airspeed is 180 knots, you take 1% of that which will yield 1.8, and then you divide that number by two to give you 0.9, and that will tell you that your turn radius should be about 0.9 nautical miles. So an initial observation is that in low speed situations, or those at or below 180 knots, this technique is incredibly accurate. However, as the speed increases above 200 knots, this technique begins to diverge away from actual performance and becomes less and less accurate. So the next technique that we're gonna look at, and the one that I've personally been using, is what I like to call the divide by three technique. In this technique, you're gonna take your nautical miles per minute and divide by three to find your turn radius. So if I'm doing 180 knots true airspeed, my nautical miles per minute is 180 knots divided by 60 to get me three nautical miles per minute, and I divide three by three to get one nautical mile turn radius, which for 180 knots is spot on to the number that I got in actual performance. This technique appears to be only marginally less accurate in low speed situations. However, across the entire range of airspeeds that we can fly in the T6, I think this technique is a lot more consistent in terms of its accuracy. You can expect about a 10% error across the entire range of airspeeds that we fly at. So the next technique I'm gonna talk about is the nautical mile squared technique. This technique is a direct derivative or simplification of the actual math used to calculate turn radius and being so is the most accurate of all the techniques that I'm gonna talk about today. In this technique, you're gonna take your nautical miles per minute, square it, and divide by nine for the most accurate number, or 10 for a simplified and easier to calculate number. So for 180 knots, that's three nautical miles per minute. Square that gets us nine nautical miles. Divided by 10 gives us 0.9 for our turn radius. So that's pretty close to what I actually flew, which is a 1.0. So for our second to last technique, we have nautical miles per minute minus two. So we're gonna take our nautical miles per minute that we're flying and subtract two from it, and that'll tell us our turn radius. So again, calculating for 180 knots, 180 in nautical miles per minute, that's going to give us three nautical miles per minute, minus two gives us a 1.0, which is exactly what I got. This technique is not very accurate at lower speeds because at 120 knots true, 
that says that our turn radius should be zero. And as we get a little bit faster, it starts to align with our technique. However, uh, at higher air speeds, this does appear to be relatively more accurate than some of the other techniques that we've discussed. Our final technique is the Mach minus two technique. So if you know your Mach number, which should be indicated on your airspeed indicator, all you have to do is subtract two from that number and that will tell you your turn radius. Unfortunately in the T6 at lower airspeeds, we don't indicate our Mach number. So this is unusable to us, but for the sake of math, I was able to figure out that all I need to know is my degrees Celsius outside and throw some math, do some calculations, and that will tell us what our Mach number is. So I use six degrees Celsius because of my OAT at 160 knots, ran some math, and I came up with these Mach numbers, equivalent Mach numbers, based on our airspeed at 10,000 feet. Then I subtracted two from those numbers and spit out the chart that you see here. So at lower air speeds, this Mach minus two technique is well, incredibly inaccurate. At 120 knots, it says we have a negative turn radius. It, you just broke space there. However, at speeds above 200 knots, I was getting numbers within one hundredth of a nautical mile. Insane. This is a very good technique at or above 200 knots. And this is what I'm going to use if I know my Mach number. So after everything, all the flying, number crunching, research, everything I did was to create this table right here. This is all the techniques laid out against my flying performance and seeing which technique most accurately reflects my performance. So I found that the most consistent technique is the nautical miles per minute squared divided by nine technique, which actually was the technique that the Air Force used to teach in the Air Force Manual 5137, which was the precursor to the 11217, which was the precursor to the 11202 Vol 3. I personally, if I ever use this technique, will use nautical miles per minute divided by 10, but just thinking in square numbers in different situations, I'm not gonna use it just because that's a lot of thinking for just a small increase in precision that we don't really need. There's so many other factors out there. Um, the most accurate in a low speed situation was the 1% rule. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. The most accurate in my estimation in high speed situations was Mach minus two. So what you'll notice is that the AFIs were actually more accurate and nautical mile per minute divided by three also showed that it was more accurate um, or equally as accurate as the Mach minus two. However, I just don't think that my data accounts for the fact that we were converging on being extremely precise in higher airspeeds. And I bet you if I was able to go up another 30 knots all the way up to, what is that, 270 knots, I'm pretty sure that this technique would show far more accuracy over any of the other techniques. So which rule am I using? I'm gonna use the 1% rule going forward. Why? Because I do think that nautical miles per minute divided by three is easy and it's pretty consistent. However, there's a lot of really cool math that you can do with the 1% rule. All right, so why did we overshoot like a big dog? I identified three potential factors which could have led us to do so. Each individual factor probably wasn't that big of a deal, but all three together was probably enough to get us off course. So the first one is the discrepancy between indicated and true airspeed. So when I'm flying around, I'm flying at 150 knots on this approach, my indicated airspeed is 150, but my true might be 180, 170. And as we saw on the math, that could be one to two tenths of a nautical mile. So not significant, but it is a factor. The next factor is human error. So this was my students first time doing an arc, first time doing the math behind a lead radial and turning to intercept the course like this. And when the time came, 
We probably flew to the point where we wanted to turn, delayed one potato, two potato. Then he starts turning probably slowly. And all of those delays probably added up to us overshooting and effectively turning at a later turn point. This is probably the biggest factor. The final and least likely factor is the discrepancy between our lead radial and the inbound course. Because the VOR is not co-located with the inbound course of the ILS, there is a slight discrepancy between our lead radial and what that means in terms of us intercepting that inbound course. So although it's not a big factor, it could have played a role. Well, that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you learned a new technique that you're gonna use while calculating a turn radius while on a published approach procedure. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And please give me suggestions on what I should do in the future because I do pay attention. Until next time, I will see you later.